The other day I was watching my nieces and nephews and they were playing with a Mr. Potato Head. And as I was watching them play with Mr. Potato Head, I recognized that St. Paul, St. Paul was right when he says, now the body is not a single part, but, but many. And I especially recognized that after my nieces and nephews did a poor job of cleaning up Mr. Potato Head and without shoes on, I stepped on his eyeballs. St. <laughs> Paul, you know, I'm like upset that St. Paul made this statement and blaming him or something like that. But here's the thing. Our second reading today, this letter to the Corinthians, goes on and on and on about the body and then about those of us who are members of the body of Christ. What a rich scripture passage. When one body suffers, St. Paul says, the rest of the body suffers with it. When one part of the body is honored, all share its joy. I think we were able to see a touch of this, in fact, even yesterday, as word spread that many of those who were at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. had been stranded on the turnpike in Pennsylvania. Bus after bus after bus, just stranded, stuck many of them high schoolers, scared and, and running out of food. They said, pray for these kids. As one part suffered, we all suffered with them. We kept them in our hearts, our minds, and our prayers. But then through social media, we started to see strange stories, stories of people building each other up, releasing each other of fear, in fact, at one point, even, one of the busloads of kids left the bus, went out into the snow, and built a snow altar. They didn't even have a priest on their bus, but a priest from another bus came over and says, what's going on? They said, we want to have Mass. Will you celebrate it? Yeah, I'll celebrate. I've got 300 hosts. Another bus empties, and then another, and another. By the time it was said and done, they say that more than 500 high school kids and others who had been on the March for Life who were stranded on the Pennsylvania Turnpike celebrated Mass together in the midst of the snowstorm on a hill just off the Turnpike on a snow altar. More than six priests eventually showed up. Students from more than six states celebrating Mass together. And we all rejoiced as members of the body of Christ. As I started to share this on my Facebook page, people were writing, you know, this brings me to tears. What a great witness. What a great example. When one member of the body is honored, we all share in its joy. I want to stick with this reading just a little bit this morning, and I want to go a little bit deeper in what it is that St. Paul is telling the Corinthians. And in fact, I want to touch a little bit upon St. Paul himself who St. Paul was, and, and then who St. Paul became. You see, St. Paul, prior to his encounter with Jesus Christ, was a Jewish man. He was a Pharisee. A Pedashim, if you look at the Hebrew. Pedashaya, if you look at the Aramaic. You don't need to remember that. I just thought you'd be impressed that I knew that. Yes. St. Paul was a Pharisee. What are the Pharisees all about? What was it that characterized the Pharisees of that day? They tried to stay separate. They separated themselves from anything or anyone who would be considered to be unclean. They did not believe that God would come to the sinners. And perhaps they had good reason to believe this, but they tried to stay away from those they considered to be impure. They thought that if they lived the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, perfectly, it would hasten the coming of the Messiah, the Anointed One. If only they could be perfect, then God would come to them. But that was their fundamental error. And St. Paul obviously came to realize that by the time he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. You see, for God desires to even glorify the weak. God desires to come to even those who are broken, who are sinful. What was it that annoyed the Pharisees so much about Jesus? that he would eat with tax collectors and he would become friends with prostitutes. And that's what we need to recognize as the body of Christ. That our God comes to us 
regardless of where we are. He does not wait for us to become perfect before He will approach us. He comes to us where we are, and we as the body of Christ must do the same to others. We must not shy away from people just because perhaps we think that they are they're sinful. They're not living a life worthy of our God. There's a, a saying, and, and sometimes it is, is called a, a tired old cliche, that says God comes to you where you are, but He loves you too much to leave you there. And I was reading a, an article where a guy called this, he, in fact, he said this is just a tired old cliche. But he's, and, and, and the reason that he said it was a tired old cliche was as such. He said, if you only believe that, that God loves you because he, he's going to move you somewhere else, then you're missing the point. God loves you where you are. It should stop there. Let's not say that his love is contingent upon you doing something else than to follow. And I, yeah, he has a point. But I think it's, it's okay to say because of this. When we recognize, when we recognize that God loves us exactly where we are, in the midst of our good days and our bad, whether we're, we're, we're perfectly living in accordance with the will of God or whether we're far from God, His love is unconditional. His love will never cease. His love continually comes to us. Once we recognize that, especially when we're not living in accordance with His will, when we recognize that He loves us even in our sinfulness, we're so overwhelmed, overwhelmed with peace and with joy that we can't help but ask, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I become who you desire for me to be? Whether we're hanging out in the brothels, perhaps on Skid Row, maybe even in the abortion clinics, our Lord still loves us. And our Lord wants more for us. You know, I'm such a little bit more about that March for Life. I don't, I don't know if you recognize this, but I'm starting to see it more and more. That the, pro, the pro-life movement in our nation these days, it's being fueled. The heart and the soul in many situations of the pro-life movement are women who have had abortions. Why? Because they've recognized this which I'm talking about today. That yes, even though they've made mistakes in the past, and their own hearts were broken because of it, they recognize that God still loves them, and His love is abundant. And that inspires them. It inspires them to, to talk to other young people to say, you do not need to do this. This is not a good option. It inspires them to talk to others who have already had abortions and to say there is healing. Come with me and I can show you the love that God has for you. You know, my friends, I, I, don't, I don't know each and every one of your sins. Perhaps you're not hanging out at the brothels or on Skid Row or, or have never been to an abortion clinic i have never been complicit in, in, in assisting somebody else in an abortion. And I hope that's the case, but it may not be. God loves you anyway. I do know that we're, we're all broken in our own ways. We've all made our own mistakes. You guys have, and so have I. And the Lord loves us, even in the midst of it. But He calls us. He calls us to something better, to, to a brighter day. And he shows, us, he shows us that we have a future. That in fact, we don't need to be perfect to commune with Him, to be in communion with Him, to be a part of His body. But when we strive to be that which He calls us to be, that peace in our heart will ever grow and ever become more profound. And so all we can do today is, is just say thank you, God, for, for understanding we miserable creatures here on earth who strive so frequently to do the right thing but then fail time and, and time again. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your body. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you.